think it's time now we go to the second part of our presentation, which is the COPD and the LDRS. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Again, questions and questions and questions. And I think if you're preparing for the exam, which you should try to solve as many questions as you can. Um, I have prepared these questions myself. I haven't taken it from any other source. And I mainly dependent on some papers. And one of them is the NET trial, the National Emphysematous Treatment Trial. Now, the National Emphysematous Treatment Trial is very, very important. Uh, you have to know, you have to read it. I think most of you or all of you have read it if you haven't read it. I've taken some time to read it. I've read it several times before. And from this, I've actually taken out some questions. Now, these are not very easy questions. If you have not read it before, it will become a little bit difficult. But step by step, we will get there. So just quickly, it's one of the randomized controlled multicenter long-term trial. That's what this trial is. It's a random controlled multicenter long-term. And this trial was actually made to compare between the lung volume reduction surgery and medical therapy. It's not for the valves. The valves have different trials. It's for the surgery. Lung volume reduction can happen through different ways. So they are going to compare the surgery between the medical therapy. And it was focusing on two points, something called the primary endpoint and something called the secondary endpoint. So the primary endpoint, they wanted to see the survival and the exercise performance, maximum exercise performance. Secondary endpoints, lung functions and the patient's symptoms and the quality of life. Now, I would like you, if you're still listening to me and I think you're still here, I want you to feel how miserable the life of a patient with a severe emphysema is. So if you're listening to me, try taking in a deep breath. And while you have your air inside, don't take it out. Start breathing like this. Try taking in a deep breath and start breathing. I, can, I think you can see me on the screen. This is a life of a patient with severe emphysema. This is how he is breathing. He's got a lot of air entrapped inside his lung. The air doesn't come out. He has very minimal reserve. He is living a terrible life. He's a long-term oxygen therapy. He can't walk to the bathroom. He can't, practically his life is very much limited. And they are trying to find anything for the treatment of these patients. They live a very, very difficult life. And for that reason, there have been ongoing trials trying to find out. And despite surgeries like LVRS are very uh, morbidity types of surgeries, which I personally don't like at all. And the patient knows the risk he's taking. He's ready to take it. And some patients tell us that if a complication happened, please leave me die. I don't want to live. So these are very poor patients who are living a very difficult life. So when they started doing the National Emphysematous Treatment Trial, and they started to say, who are we going to include in our trial, which is a very important question. So there, if you open the NET paper, you'd realize that there's such a long inclusion and such a long exclusion criteria. If I take every topic and talk about it, I'm just going to talk and talk and talk, and you're all going to sleep, and we won't be able to do any questions. So this simply, that's these are the patients they are targeting. Not all the inclusion criteria, the important ones, are patients with heterogeneous emphysema. That means the emphysema is not equal on both lobes. But you have to have a lobe out of the five lobes of the lung, the two on the left and three on the right. One of them should be your target. One of them is I'm going to target this lobe. I'm going to take out this lobe, destroy this lobe. Because the concept is once you destroy a very unhealthy lobe, you give more chance for the healthy lobe to come up and bet with better oxygenation. That is the concept of lung volume reduction. So if you don't have this targeted, very unhealthy lobe, then you're not doing the right surgery. Now, they should have an FEV1, which is forced expiratory volume one, which is the amount of air expired in the first second after maximal inspiration ranging between 20 to 45% of predicted. I don't think we've done pulmonary function tests. Maybe we'll describe it or maybe it has been mentioned, but FEV1 should be from 20 to 24 to 45%. The total lung capacity should be more than 100% post bronchodilator. The residual volume, which is the volume of air remaining in the lung after maximum expiration. And please, I do talk fast. So if you see me talking fast, tell me to slow down a bit. Should be more than 150% predicted post bronchodilator. The PACO2 should be less than 60. The PAO2 should be less than 45, and that is on room air. Six-minute walk test, it is the how far he can walk in six minutes, should be more than 140 meters. Post-rehabilitation, there should be a rehabilitation program. He should stop smoking for at least four months. If not, then you exclude him. And he should complete a pulmonary rehabilitation program, breathing exercises, which we have a team that is actually responsible for this. Once he continues all these criteria and he falls into these criteria, then we could actually discuss surgery. Now, I will start asking questions. They are a bit difficult if you haven't read it, but let's go through them one by one and hopefully we can like um, come up with, with good results from this presentation. So question one, and I'm going to be very slow when talking. With regards to the National Emphysematous Treatment Trial, the overall mortality between 
the LVRS group and the medical group was higher on the LVRS group, higher on the medical group, similar in both groups. In other words, it's a randomized trial. People were randomized into those going for surgery, those going for medical treatment. The overall mortality was higher in which group? And the answer is three. Actually, the mortality was similar in both groups. Initially, the patients who did the LVRS had a higher mortality compared to the medical group. But then after about two years, they realized that the rate of mortality became equal on both groups. Okay, so the initial was higher on the LVRS group, which is the first 30 day mortality, but then it started to become equal in both groups. And if we look at this, this is a 29.3 month follow-up. And remember when I started my presentation, I said, it's a multi-center long-term trial. It's a long-term trial. So if you look at the present three graphs here, got patients um, classified into high and non-high risk patients. We will talk about this in details. And then all patients, Look at the, just look at the one showing the all patients, A. And you've got months after randomization, uh, randomization and the probability of death. And remember, you've got a black line, which is the medical, and you've got a gray line, which is the surgical. Now, you'd realize that on the first few months, the rate of mortality was much higher. Well, yeah, it was higher on the surgical compared to the medical. But then after about 29.3 months, you'd realize that they both became the same. And then actually the surgery was lower than the medical treatment. So the first, the mortality was high, and then it started to become equal. I hope that is clear. Now, this is an interesting question. What was the performance test used in the NET trial? We have performance tests we use to check the patient's respiratory function and performance. What test do we use? Was it the incremental shuttle test? You should know what a shuttle test is. That is two shuttles about 10 meters apart and then the patient goes and comes and goes and comes and you see how far he can go and it has to be incremental. The term incremental means that he increases the pace and the speed. Was it an incremental test? Was it a six minute walk test? That is how far he can walk in six minutes or the cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which is the advanced type of testing that is, I, I don't know if it was actually present during that time, but it's not easy, it's not found in every center. And the result is the six minute walk test. So the exercise performance test they used in that trial was the six minute walk test to give them an idea about how fit and well this patient is. And he had to go more than 140 meters. Now, do we know other examples of exercise performance tests? Yes, we do, I just said them, like the incremental and the CPET test. And they measure the performance in watts. So this is the unit they measure in watts. But they just, they, because you see in, in this net trial, they wanted to see whether the patient actually improved after the surgery. So how would they do that? Well, one way is to ask him to walk for six minutes and see if he can walk for a further distance after the procedure. That is one way of doing it. And, and that is the incremental test, the, sorry, the six minute walk test. They've also used something called the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire, a questionnaire that was handed to the patient before and after treatment. And this questionnaire is made up of 100 points. And if you just look at the bottom, a total score incorporates scores. So if the uh, so if you go through it, designed to measure health impairment in patients, it consists of 50 items that surveys the patient's recollection of their symptoms, the disturbance in their physical activities, the psychological dysfunction, uh, different items, and they give them score. A total score incorporates from each component of the system of the questionnaire, which ranges from one to 100. That means if you're towards the zero, indicates a good health and 100, a worse health. So if you give this patient a questionnaire and he answers it, and he takes about, let's say for instance, he gets 70, this is his score. So he's towards a poor prognosis. He's bad, he's not good. His health is not good. And then after the LVRS surgery with about two years, you tell him to repeat the questionnaire again, and the results come out as 50, that it was previously 70, now it was 50, so there's a 20 point reduction in the questionnaire. And this is an indication that the patient actually improved. The patient became better. Is that okay? So now the patients in a net trial were classified into high and non-high risk patients. Patients with high risk characteristics were actually not candidates for the LVRS because of high mortality. They included patients with, okay. So when they did the net trial, they chose patients. And then when they started doing it, for the, after the first 30 days, they realized that there's a group of patients that are dying a lot when they're doing the surgery. And they said, okay, let's stop doing those patients. And they called them the high-risk patients. And they said, we are not going to include them and continue with them in the net trial. Now, these patients that they had to stop um, the continuing of the net trial and the LVRS surgeries on them were any patient with an FEV1 of less than 20 and the transfer factor less than 20% or a patient less than 20 with homogenous emphysema. What I'm trying to say is when they started doing this trial, 
it was randomized. And then they realized that there's a group of patients that are really dying a lot. And they said, let's not operate on them. We're killing them. And these were these group of patients, especially homogenous. Remember homogenous. Homogenous emphysema, very bad for RVRS. If you don't have a targeted, destroyed, heterogeneous loop, the concept of a homogenous emphysema is a very bad, very, very bad character. And I wouldn't proceed for LVRS for them. And what was the 30-day mortality in this group? 16% of the patients died in 30 days. And they called them the high-risk patient. They said, we're not going to continue on them. Compared to 2.2% in the non-high-risk and 0.2% with the medical treatment. And the cutoff point was 8%. So they just terminated those high-risk groups and said, we're not going to use them. We're not going to continue selecting these patients with those specific characters. And I hope that is clear. Now, the NET trial then started to be, it's a trial. It's a very, very big trial. And they said, let us divide patients. And they actually divided the patients into four different subgroups. Now, the four subgroups were depending on two things. Where is the predominance of the heterogeneous emphysema? Where is the predominance of the most destroyed part of the lung and the exercise capacity? So group one were the ones who had the upper low predominance and low exercise capacity. And if I'm going too fast, please tell me to slow down, which means, for instance, let's say a patient comes with a left upper lobe. He's got emphysema throughout his lung, but his left upper lobe is the most predominantly destroyed lobe. So he's got a left upper lobe predominance and he's got a very low exercise capacity. The second ones, they have an upper lobe predominance that is the most destroyed lobe, but they have a good exercise capacity. They have a high exercise capacity. They can walk for considerable distances. Now, the third group was the non-upper lobe predominance. That means the destruction, the most destroyed part of the lung was not the upper. For instance, it was the lower lobe and they had low exercise capacity non-upper low predominance and high exercise capacity. So they classified them into four different groups. And I will tell you why, because they're trying to find out which group would, would respond best for the LVRS surgery, which group would have the best benefit after this procedure. So question number one, question number seven, apologies. Which group showed a lower mortality with a better improvement in the maximum exercise capacity, like for instance, the six minute walk test and the St. George questionnaire? when comparing LVRS group to the medical group in 24 months. So which one of those four groups actually proved to have the best results with the least mortality and best improvement in performance of exercise based on the six minute walk test as well as the questionnaire? I will wait for, some people are answering. Uh, I'm just too, let's see what people say. Oh, they've got a lot of answers here. Okay, one, one. Okay, we've got two people saying one. Good, two. Okay, great. That's just, I'm trying to, oh, sorry, apologies. I think I am. Um, Sorry, can you see my screen again, Dr. Amri? I think you can. Okay. Yes. Um, so the answer is one. These are the best group for LVRS patients. And they improved more than 10 watts, which is the exercise performance and eight points. They went down eight points. Remember I said zero is the best, 100 is the worst. So when they repeated the questionnaire, they went down eight points. It's answer one. And these are the best patients you should target in LVRS. The ones who've got the upper lobe, destroyed heterogeneous emphysema with a low exercise capacity. Question number two. Now, which subgroup showed better improvement in the maximum exercise capacity and the questionnaire score, but had no effect on mortality when comparing the LVRS group to the medical group? So there was no change in mortality, same thing, no effect on mortality at all, no improvement, but their exercise capacity and their St. George questionnaire actually improved. Was it the upper low blow exercise? And again, the same points we're discussing. Not so sure if anybody is. Let's see if anybody's got some answers here. I'm just struggling to um, see your chats as well as the. Okay, so the answer is actually two. The patients who did an upper low predominance and high exercise capacity. That means the heterogeneous visima, as I've said, was an upper low, but the exercise capacity was quite good. Show them a response in their maximum exercise capacity and the score, but it did not have any effect on the mortality of these patients. Okay, question number three. Which subgroup showed no effect on, this is the opposite, no effect on maximum exercise capacity on the score, but had an increase in mortality when comparing the LVRS group to the medical group? Which one actually had an increase in mortality without an effect on the exercise capacity and the SGRQ score? And this is for non-upper low predominance and high exercise capacity. These patients are bad. These patients are not good. These patients had a higher mortality and showed no improvement in exercise capacity. And that is why it's always better to go for the upper low predominant target lesion than the lower low predominant target lesion. Now, last question, which subgroup showed no effect on maximum exercise capacity 
and mortality, but showed an improvement in just the score when comparing the LVRS group. And obviously this will be the non-upper low predominant low exercise capacity. And I know it's very confusing. If you get to read the net trial paper, just look at it and read it carefully, you will find it actually makes perfect sense. And at the end, what I'm trying to reach is that upper low predominance with low exercise capacity are the best. Non-upper low predominance with high exercise capacity are the worst. As long as you know these two points, I think it's enough. Now, the patients with a low upper zone perfusion that was measured by the perfusion scintigraphy indicates a survival advantage with LVRS in patients with an upper lobe uh, predominant emphysema. True or false? I know the questions are a little bit difficult, but then if the upper lobe zone had shown to have low perfusion by scintigraphy, would this patient have a survival advantage? And the answer is actually, yes, it's true. If you do a pulmonary, if you do a perfusion scintigraphy and realize that the blood going to the upper lobe is actually quite low, this is an advantage to those patients when they go for surgery. With regards to the net trial, the most common post-operative complication after LVRS within 30 days post-surgery was, was it the arrhythmia, the pneumonia, reintubation, readmission to ITU? And the answer is cardiac arrhythmias. It's the most common complication. Now, I'm pretty sure all of you have gone through some patients of LVRS, and I'm telling you the complications are very bad, and especially the pneumonia and the reintubation and the persistent air leak. It's a nightmare. But cardiac arrhythmias, according to the NET trial, had shown the highest um, rate of 30-day post-operative complication. There's something called sole predictor of operative mortality, the single predictor that actually has a direct impact on operative mortality in the NET trial. And what was that? What was the sole predictor? It's actually the non-upper low predominant emphysema. It is the predictor. So non-upper low predominance is actually what is the predictor of the possibility of a mortality in these patients. The upper low predominant heterogeneous emphysema are usually the best. Now, the NET trial, it also compared between median stenotomy and BATS. You know, median, st median stenotomy is used in the NET trial, and it can actually do surgery from both sides, and it compared it with BATS regarding patients' mortality, morbidity, and the functional outcome. Which group had a higher 90-day mortality? And this is quite a surprise, because I thought it was median stenotomy. Which I predicted it would have a higher day of mortality because of pain. But looking at it, actually, there was no difference between the mortality of the median stenotomy group as well as the VATS group. And again, I'm apology for not looking at the chat because it, the computer just stops once I try. Uh, so no difference in 30 day, 90 day mortality between median stenotomy and VATS. Now, and if you compare between median stenotomy and VATS, you'd realize that the interoperative blood loss and transfusion, again, a surprise similar, despite that this is actually a stenotomy. The operating time was longer in VATS. That makes sense. Interoperative complication higher in VATS. Median hospital stay was only longer in median stenotomy, and obviously it might be related to the pain. But the complications and the operative times longer in thoracoscopic surgery. This is something that I always thought about, and I've been asking around, and it's nice to have the answer to this question, is did the LVRS patients actually show an increase in their pulmonary artery pressure in the net trial? Because I thought that if you take out, because we don't take out the lobe, we take out the wedge. You wedge, you, in, in LVRS, you wedge, you don't lobe. You don't do lobectomy, you do wedge resections. And I thought, well, you do take out some of the pulmonary vessels, don't you, in the stapler? So does it have an impact on the pulmonary artery pressure? So when you think about it, yes. But when they did the net trial, actually, it doesn't. In fact, it actually reduces the intracardiac pressure. So there is no effect on the pulmonary artery pressure, which is a wrong concept that I personally had in my brains for quite some time. Now, you know how you classify uh, emphysema into mild, moderate, severe, and very severe? And when we take referrals from respiratory physicians about patients who are indications for LVRS, or when we, when we read the pulmonary function test report at the end, he says severe um, uh, emphysema, very severe emphysema, moderate. So it's very important that you know how you actually classify them. So according to the NICE guidelines, and I'm using the NICE guidelines here, a patient with an FEV1 of 35%, and an FEV1 over an FEC of less than 0.7%. So he's got an FEV1 of 35. What would you classify him? I, he's a, I mean, a simple exam question. Would it be mild, moderate, severe, or very severe? Again, if I'm going fast, please just stop me and I'll slow down. And if he's got an FEV1 of 35 with an FEV1 over FEC of less than 0.7, the answer would be severe airway obstruction. Okay, it's a bit confusing. Yeah, we can actually look at this table. That is the grading of severity of airway obstruction. I think this is recorded, so I won't go through it again because it's going to take some time. 
Uh, anybody wants to take a screenshot, take a picture of it, look at the NICE guidelines, the gold severity of the NICE guidelines, 2004, 2010, there's something called gold, which is the guidelines to use for classification of emphysema. Look at them and then just memorize them so that if it comes in an exam question, you'll be able to define it. Um, this is a, how do I, I put this question in, and to be honest, I wasn't sure whether I would put that question or not, but let's see. Um, the Combivent trial is a trial that randomly assigned 534 patients with COPD to relieve the albitrol, beta-2, epitrol, pembromide, antimuscarinics, or the combination. So remember when we, uh, when we prescribe nebulizers for the patients, especially when they are on, when they go home with them, should, should we do the beta-2 agonists or the antimuscarinics, or should we actually combine them together? So the combination therapy, when they put them both together, did it have no effect on the peak FEV1 with reduction and exacerbation? You know, COPD patients, they have in the UK something called a rescue pack. They go home with a rescue pack. It's an antibiotics and steroids. They keep them in the house. And once they get an exacerbation of the COPD, they automatically take their antibiotics and they take their steroids. So they wanted to see whether or not we should give both groups of uh, bronchodilators. And if we combine them together, does it actually have an effect on the forced expiratory volume in the first second? And what about the exacerbation of the COPD? So no effect on the mean peak FEV1 with reduction on exacerbation? No, it has no effect on the mean peak FEV1 with, on the peak FEV1 with no effect on exacerbation. Increasing the mean peak FEV1 with reduction, or does it actually increase the peak FEV1 with no effect on exacerbation? I know it's a bit of a medical question, but I thought that it's important that we have an idea about this because you see those patients and we ask them about their medications. So they actually found out that when we combine the, both the medications, the bronchodilators, it actually resulted in an improvement in the forced expiratory volume in the first second, and it had um, no effect on exacerbation. So it has nothing to do with the fact that he gets recurrent chest infection, but it definitely has an effect on his FEV1. Now, this is important, and I, I really would like you to concentrate on this question, because there are two studies, two landmark studies, for hypoxemia and COPD. You know, the COPD patients, they have the long-term oxygen therapy. Sometimes they come with the tank in the hospital. So this is not empirical. This is not just something that they thought about. This is actually based on studies. And in treating hypoxemia, something called the UK Medical Research Council, the MRC, and the US Nocturnal Oxygen Therapy Trial, the NOT. So these are two trials that have been researches to see whether these patients actually benefit if you give them long-term oxygen. So they showed that long-term oxygen therapy, when given for greater than how many hours a day, improved survival in patients with COPD and chronic hypoxemia with or without hypercapnia. So even the number of hours a patient should have his oxygen on actually had an effect on his patient survival. So how many hours are the patients actually on oxygen? Five, 5 10, 15, or 20. And when I asked the patient, he asked him, are you on long-term oxygen therapy? And he says, yes, I am. And then I tell him, you're taking this much hour and says, yes. So I actually know the answer of this question from the patients that I've talked to. And the answer is 15. They're always on 15 hour with the nasal cannula oxygen connected to them and they've got the tank walking with the tank or they've got the oxygen at home. And this is actually showed to improve survival. Now, um, I think I've got about 15 minutes left in this presentation and um, a couple of more questions. And I thought that I would take the chance to talk about the endobronchial valves, especially the Zephyr valves. Now, why I'm talking about this, I'm not doing an advertisement for this company. They are expensive valves, but I have worked in Oxford with some of the doctors who are very, very good in these valves, and they're doing a lot of researches on them. And in Birmingham as well, one of the, our clinical lead is very much into these valves, and he is the main author of the um, ERAS, and they are very much into the valves. And I think the trend is actually going towards endobronchial valves, then LDRS surgeries. And if you look at a patient who has had an endobronchial valve and you compare him with a patient who has had a lung volume reduction surgery, trust me, the difference is huge. One patient goes home in a couple of days, the other stays in the hospital. Got a patient in the hospital now for 35 days with two and a half liter air leak that we can't do anything with, just treating him with antibiotics every now and again because he keeps on getting infection. So I don't like LDRS, but definitely, definitely, I, I love those valves because they're very effective to my point of view. And the most important thing is that even if they're not effective, they don't usually cause much harm to the patient. So the uh, Pulmonex is a big company that has actually been producing those valves and it's been doing its own researches on them. And they did these very three important papers that 
I think everybody should know about. And if you read the uh, FRCTS questions, key questions, things like this, you would realize that they have been mentioned. One of them is called the liberate, one's called the transform, and one of them is called the impact. These three randomized trials are trials for the endobronchial valves. They're trying to see how effective they are. And they are very dareful because they're not only seeing how effective they are in heterogeneous emphysema, they're actually seeing if they have a role in homogeneous emphysema. And as I've said, homogeneous emphysema is a red line when you do LDRS surgeries. If you don't have a very selected target lung that you're going to wedge off and everything looks the same, do not do, not do an LDRS patient. Because as the concept is, you're trying to remove diseased lung so the healthy lung gets up and produces a better function. But if you remove a lung and they're all the same, so you're actually reducing, so think about it, you're just reducing his, his respiratory reserve because you've taken a lung that is comparatively equal to the rest of the lung. And I hope that makes sense. And if I would, I'm happy to explain that again. So what are these valves? This is the valve, very small structures. Unfortunately, they are very expensive. And I think a valve itself has cost maybe a thousand sterlings, a thousand pounds. And these valves, they are, they are very small and I'm sure how small they are now. They've got this membrane and then they've got the retainer. They've got a valve protector and they've got this very small valve inside. And I'll show you what it is. So they are deployed. So you've got this very small catheter that goes into the flexible bronchoscopy inside your airway. And then you deploy them and then they open. Like for instance, apologies, um, uh, like for instance, this one. See how it, is? it just goes in and then it deploys and it sits at the uh, beginning of the segmental bronchus. And what is the concept of these valves? These valves allow air to go from inside the lung to outside, but does not allow air to go from outside to inside. So air will go from the distal and out. It'll be, see this white line here? Air is being pushed out. Okay, but air cannot go in. So it's a unidirectional valve. And at the same time, the mucus produced by the glands inside can actually go out. So mucus goes out, air goes out, nothing goes in. And so the lobe starts to collapse. And when the lobe starts to collapse, the epsilateral lobe on the same side, which is supposed to be more healthy, starts to get bigger. And then the lung functions of the patient improve. And that is the concept. But to be able to do this, and let's, for instance, talk about the left lung, which has an upper lobe and a lower lobe. And we all know that between them, there's a fissure. Now, the fissure sometimes is complete if you've done lobectomies before, which is very good. And sometimes it's incomplete and stuck. So if I'm trying to remove all the air from the left upper lobe by the valves, I have to make sure that the left upper lobe is not communicating with the left lower lobe. Because if both lobes are communicating, it only means that there's a collateral circulation, ventilation from the left lower to the upper. So if I block air, stop air from going into the left upper lobe, it's a good job. The valves will be very functional. But if the left upper lobe is being ventilated from the left lower lobe, then I'm practically doing nothing because air will still go to the left upper lobe from the bottom. And that is what we call as collateral ventilation. And for this reason, we do something called Chartis. Chartis is a device which contains this very small catheter. Can you see that? That's pushed inside the bronchus and this balloon blows up. So it blocks the bronchus. Let's say, for instance, it's gone into the right upper lobe bronchus. So it's going to block the right upper lobe bronchus. So in a perfect world, the right upper lobe bronchus or the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the right upper lobe bronchus should change. If you block it, that means it's not being ventilated. So if you measure the amount of oxygen in the right upper lobe bronchus, it just start going down, 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 and the carbon dioxide just start going up, up, up. That means it is not ventilated from any other ipsilateral lobe. Now, what happens if you put this device into the right upper lobe bronchus, and yet the tip of this device here, which is inside, is actually detecting oxygen. So where is this oxygen coming from? Well, it's coming from the epsilateral lobe by a collateral ventilation. And if this happens, then you can't put an LDRS. You can't put an endobronchial valve. And that is why the chart is it's very important to do before you put an endobronchial valve. And that's what we've been talking about, the chart is measurement. And Pulmonex has developed this beautiful software called Stratex, and we use that at Birmingham. And it actually, you put in your high resolution CT scan, and it's a very advanced software that can give you an idea about the lobes and the fissures. Now, let's look at this, for instance. Now, this is an image that I have taken from the Pulmonex itself. It's not from our patients or anything. So if you look here, you've got the right lung, you've got the left lung. The left lung has an upper lobe, lower lobe. The right lung has an upper, middle, lower. Now, black indicates severe, Emphysema, okay, heterogeneous emphysema. You can see that the colors, the three colors are completely different. This is 
heterogeneous. But if they're all the same color, it's homogeneous. So you've got heterogeneous emphysema. You've got on the left side, it's black. And black means that it is very diseased lung. Gray, moderately diseased lung. And the white is less diseased lung. Let's just make it this way. They do something called the voxel density. Let's not go into details. So I'm looking at this lung. I can tell you, well, the left upper lobe and the right upper lobe are very diseased lung. And it is heterogeneous. So I could target the left upper lobe or the right upper lobe with an endobronchial valve. Now, which lobe should I choose? Okay, let's look on the right side. Can you see those dotted gray lines here and then the, the straight gray line? That means these fissures are incomplete. That means the right lower lobe could actually cause ventilation to the upper and the middle lobe could cause ventilation to the upper. So if I block this upper lobe with a valve, collateral ventilation will come from here, collateral ventilation will come from here, the valve will do nothing. So this right side is not good. Now let's look at the left side. The black line indicates that there's a complete fissure. That means more or less, there is very, very little or no communication between the upper lobe and the lower lobe. And at the same time, the upper lobe is heterogeneous. It's very diseased. So if I target this left upper lobe, it will collapse because nothing is coming from the lower lobe. So that is the pulmonex. That is the Stratex lung report. That's the system they use to find out whether the lobes are suitable for endobronchial valves or not. Now, a couple of questions, and I think I've got 10 minutes left. I'll finish those questions, and that is it. Which trial? One of those trials actually showed that there was an increase in the FEV1 more than 15% in one year. Which one of those trials? So the Liberate trial is actually a trial that was done comparing patients who had the endobronchial valves to the control group which were medically treated. And they showed that the patients who had an endobronchial valve had an increase in their first expiratory volume in uh, more than 15%. For instance, it started at 30, and after one year, it was 45 and more. So it's a very, very good result for them. And this trial said that at one year post-randomization, the difference between the Zephyr valves and the control group for the percentage of subjects meeting the threshold of 15 or more improved, differed significantly. So not only did it improve more than 15%, but the number of patients who had the valve compared to the medical were much higher in the valve group that actually increased more than 15%. So they did reach their target. Now, I don't know if they're biased because there are companies that are trying to sell products, but I have personally seen very good results from these valves. But you have to be very careful when you select the patients. You have to have an MDT. We have MDTs. We discuss the results and we see whether those patients are suitable for valves or not. Now, there are some tricks when you use those valves. One of them is this question. While consenting the patient for an endobronchial valve, he says, look, doctor, I have had a previous allergy to jewelry, to uh, something jewels he's wearing. And then the GP said it's a contact dermatitis. And so you as a doctor know that this patient is going to have an endobronchial valve, which is a day case procedure. And he should go home. Sorry, it's not a day case procedure. Apologies. He goes home in a couple of days. He's going to have an endobronchial valve. And you tell him, hold on, I need to talk to my consultant. I'm a bit concerned. You said you have allergy to jewelry. Should he be concerned? Well, the answer is yes, he should be concerned because endobronchial valves are made up from nickel titanium, what we call as nitinol. Titanium could be used in jewelry and you have to make sure that he's not allergic to it and then put a valve which would cause tremendous amount of inflammation. And for that reason, nickel, sorry, apologies, not titanium, nickel is found in jewelry. And for that reason, the endobronchial valve company, this is the company itself, put those contraindications and who's got previous bronchoscopic procedures, you've got an active pulmonary infection, the allergies, uh, allergy to silicon, uh, who have not quit smoking, and then large bully more than 30%. So they have actually put certain contraindications telling you do not use our valves in these patients. Now, a 56-year-old female patient with a history of a COPD and three endobronchial valves, which were inserted for her right upper lobe. Okay, epical anterior posterior segments. So they put three endobronchial valves and the right upper lobe to collapse it, chart is done, no collateral ventilation, everything's nice. She had a very smooth recovery, recovery, no complication. When will you tell the patient to go home? So she's in your ward and you are, she's happy. She's on some nasal oxygen, she's telling you she feels different. Always those patients after the procedure, they get the psychological feel that they're doing better. And, and, and the reason is because we put them on some steroids and you know, steroids are happy drugs. So you give them some steroids and they feel that they're doing very well. Um, so when do you charge the patient home? Same day, after a day, after two days, or after three days? And the answer is three days. You have to wait three days. Now, why do you wait 72 hours? 
So this is the result of, this is why you do that. So on the second day, post-operative day two, you start getting chestness and shortness of breath, becoming hypoxic. What is the diagnosis and what is the management? Pneumothorax. The answer the problem is she gets a pneumothorax and you have to put in a chest strain. And 76% of pneumothoraces, if they're going to occur, they're going to occur in the first three days of procedure. And when you do an endobronchial valve for the patient, the problem is that when you collapse a lobe, the epsilateral lobe on the same side will start to expand. And the expansion of the epsilateral lobe could actually rupture. And this is the reason why they get a pneumothorax. The pneumothorax does not happen from the targeted lobe. The pneumothorax happens from the epsilateral lobe on the same side because it starts to grow. For that reason, when you put valves, you do an x-ray after four hours in recovery. So she comes from theaters, goes to recovery. Before she goes to her ward, an x-ray is done. And then you do an x-ray for 24 hours. And once we have an endobronchial valve, our protocol is start antibiotics, start steroids, keep a drain set next to the patient. Doesn't have to be sitting next to the bed, but even in the corridor, keep a drain set ready. You tell your SHO, you tell the registrar, keep an eye on her. If she goes hypoxic or chest chestitis, respiratory distress, it's a pneumothorax, get a chest drain in. Now, one of these valves, the liberate and the transform and the impact valves actually uh, was done to effect, study the efficacy of the fear valves in homogenous emphysema. And I remember when I told you homogenous emphysemas are actually not, um, uh, LVRS is not done in homogenous emphysema. But uh, well, this is what they're saying. They're saying that the impact trial actually had shown um, that these valves did have good results in improvement in FEV1 and the lung function and quality of life and so on in homogenous emphysema. Uh, probably, yes. So it is main, maybe the only um, kind of treatment you could actually use in homogenous emphysema. Now, there's something called the heterogeneity score in emphysema, and uh, it's just the difference between uh, the structure between the target probe and the epsilateral lobe. The answer is one. It's I, I don't think it's an important question. And um, just two questions are left now. And, and let's see. I will ask this question. I will wait for a couple of minutes. I know you're all tired. I'm getting exhausted as well. So let's just see how much information you were able to pick up from this presentation, because these two questions tell us how much you were able to know. So let's say a 58-year-old gentleman named X. He's got COPD, got an FEV1 of 30%, and he's got a DLCO of 28%. So he is meeting the criteria. Six-minute walk test, 200 meters. Sigil volume, 170%. What I'm putting in this question is that I'm telling you a patient has good criteria, good inclusion criteria. Echocardiogram was done, normal RV, uh, no signs of pulmonary hypertension because these are contraindications of LVRS. CT shows heterogeneous left upper lobe. Stratix was done showing an incomplete fissure between the left upper and the lower lobe. Would you say that this patient goes for an LVRS, an endobronchial valve, or he's not suitable for both? So this is the question. Read the question carefully. I will give you a couple of minutes just to make sure that you have uh, understood some of the results of the presentation. Let's see if I could actually see what results are being said. Mm. Yes, Dr. Khaldun, thank you very much. Let's see if I could just, um, yep, people are beginning to answer. I'll wait a couple of more seconds. Good. So people said LVRS. Yes, you will do LVRS because he fits the criteria of LVRS. And not only does he fit the criteria of LVRS, he's got an incomplete fissure. So he's got collateral ventilation. So if he's got a collateral ventilation, you can't put an endobronchial valve because he'll be ventilated from the epsilateral lobe. So the best answer is lung volume reduction surgery. Okay, LVRS. Okay, good. Now, last question. 69-year-old lady, POPD, FEV1, 30%, DLCO, 17%, 1.7. Okay, she has a six-minute walk test of 100 meters, residual volume, 170%. Echocardiogram, severe pulmonary hypertension. But on the CT scan, she's got a severe, she's got heterogeneous left upper lobe predominant emphysema. Stratax, complete fissure between the left upper and lower. So she's okay. What would her appropriate management be? So she's got predominant left upper lobe and she's got a complete fissure. Would you go for an LVRS, endobronchial valves, or would you say this patient is not a suitable candidate? Okay, interesting. Got some questions. Oh, good. People are answering. Okay. Okay, good. So people are actually saying no. They're saying number two. No, you wouldn't use endobronchial valve. This patient is unfit for anything. Look, she's got severe pulmonary hypertension with signs of RV failure, and she's got a DLCO of less than 20%. It's not about the heterogeneity and it's not about the fissure. 
you, when, when we choose patients who are suitable for these procedures, we have to make sure that they fulfill the inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria of LDRS is equal to the inclusion criteria of endobronchial valve. The only difference is mainly the fissure, if she's got a complete or incomplete fissure. What I'm trying to say is, if you've got a patient with an FEV1 of 30, yes, but a TLCO of less than 20%, he's got a six minute walk test less than 140 meters, <clears throat> his echo shows RV failure with signs of severe pulmonary hypertension, you cannot put for this patient anything. It's too risky. The risk of mortality is high. And so the answer for this is, he's not suitable. He's not suitable for anything actually. And I don't know, maybe he's a candidate later on for transplantation, but definitely he's not a suitable candidate for um, for this procedure. And um, thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much for your time. And I think this is the last question. Hopefully we have come up to something. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Sayyid Wallahi. Ahla li nashkur hadratak. Jazakumullah khairan, Dr. Shatila. Very nice presentation. Uh, yani, uh, would like to repeat it again. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah, 